Hi, welcome to Gemma Network Open Live. I'm Seth Truger, Digital Media Editor, Gemma Network Open. And I'm Angel Desai, Jama Fishbein Fellow. Thanks for joining us. Uh, given everything that's going on with the coronavirus or COVID-19, uh, things are a little different today. We're not doing our usual episode. Uh, as you can see, part of our studio has been uh, stripped and rearranged um, as uh, Jama has been doing some really great videos uh, that you should check out with Editor-in-Chief Howard Bachner. Um, he just spoke to um, Jay Butler, Dr. Jay Butler from the CDC. Um, you can uh, check out that video on YouTube or on Periscope on the Twitter stream for JAMA Current. Um, and also go to the JAMA resource page uh, for COVID. It's ja.ma slash COVID. Um, great resources, a lot of stuff there, redirects to the CDC's resources and a, bu and a bunch of other things, including the, um, the handful of great videos made by our great video team here. Uh, same team we use, which is fantastic. Um, so today, uh, instead of talking about the usual papers that we talk about for Gemma Network Open, we're going to do a little coronavirus chat. So I think the first question that is on everyone's mind is, how does it feel without the facial hair? <laughs> um, and tell us about why you did that, too. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Uh, so it's very strange for me. I've had a beard basically since 2014. Mm -hmm. um, I've shaved a handful of times since, but this is the first time I've shaved twice uh, since, I'm oh, sorry, since 2004. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, since okay. senior year of college. Uh, so this is the first time I've shaved more than once in 16 years. Uh, <laughs> and uh, basically, uh, the the main thing is uh, for N95 masks, the mask we use for mm -hmm. tuberculosis, uh, the main thing we use for, for serious exposure to the patients, uh, you need essentially mask to skin contact. You need mm -hmm. to be specifically fit tested uh, to test that it works, that the mask fits you properly. Um, and, and that you're not contaminated, as I'm sure you've been fit tested a number of mm -hmm. times in your career. Yeah. Um, and most of the docs here, I, I'm sure, can relate. Uh, so my initial plan before things ramped up was, oh, I've got my beard. I'll keep my beard. And uh, if, if I need to take care of sick patients, I'll use a papper, you know, the, the big hazmat yeah. hoods. Um, and uh, then basically started having uh, uh, patient interactions where it wasn't like, oh, my God, they're really sick and we need to intubate mm -hmm. them. But it's like, I just need to go in and reassess their belly pain. But they're on these the droplet precautions for COVID. And, and you know, I'm, I'm young and we're pretty young and pretty healthy. Um, I'm not too worried about me getting sick. But one, if I have to, you know, if I get exposed and have to miss work for a while, mm -hmm. it's a health care worker who's down. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, don't want to get my patients or coworkers sick or spread, spread it in any way. So uh, just having the ability to be able to throw on a mask. Um, and, and take care of a patient, I think makes a lot of sense. I think so too. That's great. <laughs> but yeah, to answer your first question, it's really weird. My, my wife and daughter keep looking at me really I funny. I was going to ask you, do they recognize you? Um, my, my daughter just keeps looking at me with this weird smile and saying it's really weird. She does not like it. I don't like it. I walk past the mirror and uh, it just doesn't feel like me. It's a strange transfer. It's for a greater here. purpose. Yeah. So. <laughs> I mean, I do what I can. <laughs> <laughs> so you kind of alluded to this, um, and as some of our viewers may know, you work in an ER mm -hmm. when you're not um, behind the JNO live desk here. Yep. Um, so I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about what the atmosphere has been like in the hospital over the last several weeks. Yeah, so it's tough. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. I think there's just a lot of uh, a lot of just like extra anxiety that people have. Yeah. Uh, you know, everyone's people are everyone's coming to work. Everyone's taking care of patients. Mm -hmm. um, patients, I think, have all been wonderful. Coworkers have been fantastic. The hospital, you know, everyone in the health system has been really doing their best to try to figure out the best way to make things work. Uh, but there's so much uncertainty, both in the, the number of cases we're seeing, the number of potential cases we're seeing, how to do testing, how operations work, where can patients get admitted to when you do this thing, and and it's just uh, there's just like that extra bit of. Uh, I don't know if anxiety is the right word, but it's yeah, kind of like anticipation. A, yeah, yeah, and just it's like you know that little bit of a guitar string tuned a little bit too tight. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. That just everything has a little bit of a air of tension, and, and a lot of it's the uncertainty of, of not knowing where things are going to go. Right. Um, not to be too shameless about plugging that Gemma video from from last week with uh, Mauricio from uh, Italy. Yeah. Um, but you know, seeing where things are probably going to be going in a few weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and, and where we really strain the healthcare system and, you know, completely run out of ICU beds and stuff like that. It's uh, there's definitely a lot of anxiety about what's going to happen in the future and where things are going to be. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, you and I had talked about earlier the fact that, uh, you know, working in the ER and also just your schedule, you sort of have work in intervals. Mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if you could just walk us through a little bit about, you know, have you seen sort of gradual changes, both in terms of that you've mentioned a little bit from a structural perspective, mm -hmm. but also just in terms of, you know, the patients or the workflow, what that's been like? Sure. Um, yeah, I have to say, I initially, when things first started ramping up, mm -hmm. I was actually kind of surprised they weren't getting this big influx of the the worried well mm -hmm. or people with, with low acuity disease. Um, obviously, the numbers are up a little bit, but but not. I mean, I think I worked, 
uh, you know, a couple of days in a row with one patient who was like, I have a cold and I want to be tested. And this is well before testing was available mm -hmm. in any real way and, and um, didn't have any concerning risk factors or things mm -hmm. like that. And, um, and uh, you know, no real issues. Um, and everybody's been, been really great about it. The, uh, but what kind of we're seeing over time is just kind of the, the move to, to patients, to sick patients coming to the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I mean, it's, it's, it certainly seems you know, worse than typical flu. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was a, uh, I basically re essentially retracted or corrected a tweet I said sharing an infographic from JAMA a couple weeks ago, um, you know, showing the comparison from stats, like, you know, potential for badness from coronavirus, yeah. but flu is known badness of, you know, tens of thousands of deaths a year right, and things right, like that. Right. Um, but th this is definitely different in just mm -hmm. the, the number of people who are coming into the hospital, the rapidity of, of how sick people are getting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's just very different. It's really scary. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, you know, I guess taking a step back, uh, one of the things that we've been hearing a lot about, I think, in the media, but then also, you know, from experts is this question about testing availability. Mm -hmm. And um, I would suspect that being in the ER, that's, you know, really important in terms of you being the front line um, or part of the front line. So have you uh, had any difficulties obtaining the test or being able to test people that are uh, suspected of having COVID-19? Yeah, good question. Um, what's been really interesting with testing is at first, uh, we've been lucky in Illinois where we were a little bit ahead of the curve mm -hmm. and Illinois Department of Public Health or IDPH uh, had the ability to test. I think we were, if not the one of the first states to do state level testing instead of sending things to CDC. Um, and so I think back in like mid to late February, mm -hmm. we had tests. Mm -hmm. There were pretty strict criteria. And even after we kind of knew the cat was out of the bag, mm -hmm. we still could only test people with specific contact mm -hmm. uh, contacts with people who were, had tested positive or to the high risk countries like mm -hmm. Uh, Italy, Iran, Korea, China, Japan. I might be missing a couple. Mm -hmm. um, uh, even when there was clearly already community spread, yeah. um, unless there were other very clear clinical reasons to test people. Yeah. Um, so that was a little interesting. But things have really changed. Uh, starting not very long ago, we've been sending tests out to Quest, just kind okay. of like normal tests. Yeah. Um, and they've been coming back in a pretty reasonable time period. Well, that was going to be my next question, you know, because <laughs> right. I think that waiting period is, you know, not it's not just about having availability, but also how long does it take mm -hmm. to be able to start making? I mean, uh, of course, you know, if you suspect, then you're going to treat somebody. Right. as having, you know, um, suspected until confirmed, essentially. Right. But um, I would imagine that that changes things sure. if you can get things back quickly. Yeah. Well, you know my cautious or my my, uh, my optimism. Yes. Uh, <laughs> one of the good things is that uh, there's there's no directed treatment. It's supportive mm -hmm. care. Mm -hmm. um, so really the only issues are basically um, quarantine or isolation um, for, as far as testing goes. And we know it's not a perfect test anyway. So even a negative test doesn't get people out of the woods. Mm -hmm. Um, so the good news is the testing isn't changing management a ton right now. Mm -hmm. The test is primarily for epidemiolo mm -hmm. epidemiological reasons, you know, to hold flatten the curve. Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting was at first the tests were supposed to take 24 to 48 hours. Mm -hmm. um, and then as the state was getting overwhelmed, it was really like four or five days mm -hmm. or so. Um, I think, I don't know ex the exact timeline, but they were also confirming them at, at CDC mm -hmm. initially. Mm -hmm. So that was probably part of the turnaround mm -hmm. as well, I would guess. Um, what's interesting is that this, the lab send outs we've been doing, um, I've noticed have been like 24 to 48 hours and really the shorter side. I've been really surprised how oh, short the test yeah. been. I'd say it's it's been like longer than a TSH, closer to a urine culture than a blood culture at this point. Oh, do you <laughs> order a lot of TSHs? Um, as the an culture, aside. My, my residents seem to like them a lot. Yeah. It's, it's a little hospital thing. <laughs> it, I'd say, yeah, I don't personally need TSHs a lot. Um, but uh, one of the things I'm curious, I mean, we're also starting local testing now mm -hmm. in our hospital. Mm -hmm. um, Illinois has been good about getting uh, testing capability out to hospitals. Mm -hmm. um, and so if we are not up to speed now, we, we have, we're going to have it any, any minute now, essentially. Um, the, I think there's still going to be some overflow. We're only going to have, you know, each, each hospital is only going to have so much capacity to test and then send an overflow to, to, to um, commercial labs like Quest. Mm -hmm. Sorry, mm -hmm. that rhymed. Uh, the, uh, um, and then when, when, you know, Quest gets overloaded, however it does, they're mm -hmm. going to send stuff out either to, uh, you know, IDPH or CDC or University of Washington, mm -hmm. your alma mater, yeah. uh, which is, uh, which is, I think been on the forefront of just kind of doing nat nationwide testing. Mm -hmm. So Definitely. The, I mean, one of the best things right now is we're really on this uptick of seeing how much test availability there is, mm -hmm. especially for people who need it. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, so 
I think just switching gears a little bit, mm -hmm. have you seen or can you describe sort of the spectrum of the illness that you've seen? Because again, being in the ER, I imagine you see sort of, and, and we know that there is a spectrum of disease yep. um, here. And we there, I think there's also been a lot of discussion about, you know, if you have mild disease, try to stay at home, self quarantine in order to try to alleviate some of the um, the volume that's kind of coming in through through the ERs. Yeah. So I think that the first thing is we definitely know some people ha carry the virus, but don't necessarily have symptoms. Mm -hmm. uh, there's certainly either an incubation period or people who never present with symptoms. Uh, there's definitely seem to be people with mild disease mm -hmm. uh, with basically just like a run of the mill cold or also what's interesting that we're seeing is there's um, GI symptoms potentially as well that like a third or half of patients maybe have just GI symptoms mm -hmm. or or kind of upper respiratory plus GI symptoms mm -hmm. um, which isn't totally unreasonable or, or atypical for us we've seen that before with with other URI viruses and, mm -hmm. and flu like stuff mm -hmm. you know hence the term stomach flu mm -hmm. um, what's really interesting on, on that note is uh, you know from the epi point of view that's terrifying because that means there can get a lot of spread from people mm -hmm. just kind of like normal URI type symptoms uh, a lot of people this is this is reckless speculation, but a lot of people have been speculating, you know, maybe some of the earlier earlier flu type stuff we've seen this year has been coronavirus oh, and it's been here longer. Yeah. And that's why community spare was, so who the hell knows? <laughs> um, the, uh, um, but what's very strange for me is uh, I've kind of always told the, the prudent layperson uh, standard line that it's impossible to tell from your symptoms in general if you're sick or not. You know, if you have... If you have belly pain, you don't know if it's appendicitis or, mm -hmm. or just a stomach bug. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you need to get seen by seen by a healthcare provider, get worked up and evaluate, and even low acuity stuff. Like we don't know until you see a patient, until you do like a uh, uh, medical screening exam. Um, and this is a totally different world because we're so close to uh, potentially overwhelming healthcare resources. But basically, in general, uh, people without comorbidities, people without risk factors for for getting really sick, people who don't need hospital based care, who don't need um, you know oxygen nursing potential for ICU care and things mm -hmm, like that like mm -hmm. are almost certainly better off for themselves and for everybody else not coming to the hospital mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. so that we don't overwhelm resources and so we don't draw more people together around more sick people mm -hmm. spread more droplets around and and worsen things mm -hmm. okay yeah um, that, I think that makes a lot of sense yeah to th then the second part of your question that there, there are certainly some sicker people and some of it just seems to be kind of bad flu spectrum mm -hmm. um, you know flu-like illness uh, but uh, uh, apparently, I, it seems like we're seeing a lot of hypoxia, a lot of oxygen requirements. Mm -hmm. um, and especially the stories coming out of Italy are people who just uh, really precipitous drops in the respiratory status, mm -hmm. uh, start out a little hypoxic, and then a day later are intubated in the ICU on mm -hmm. four pressers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So really big spectrum yeah. <laughs> yeah. there. Yeah. So basically nothing too deathly ill. Yeah. yeah. That's that. I think, and I think that's part of the challenge, right, mm -hmm. in managing these patients. Um, Absolutely. And just trying to figure out triage and, you know, again, as you mentioned with the resources issue, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a problem. Um, you know, I think one thing that we don't necessarily talk a lot about is, um, and something that I've been recognizing more as I, as I speak with some of my colleagues that are working in some of the um, areas that have been hardest hit is just the sort of stress um, and toll that all of this takes on healthcare workers. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if that's something that you've um, come across uh, or, and you know, if, if there are any strategies that you, you help you manage your own stress potentially. Yeah, no, it's, it's tough. I mean, I haven't figured out anything wonderful for myself. Mm -hmm. I will tell you, um, you know, the, the silly things I'm certainly bickering at home, my mm -hmm. wife more, uh, <laughs> you know, it's clearly things are different. Yeah. I think, uh, I'm generally pretty even tempered. And I think the thing that started to freak my wife out the most is when I wasn't being dismissive of stuff. Oh no. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I think, and that's part of it. And it, it's kind of, that's kind of always been my philosophy as far as things like, like I'm a fan of area management. I, I like that stuff. And that the more you prepare and the, the better you, you know, all the fundamentals mm -hmm. and you know, more advanced stuff that you have that kind of brain space when things yeah. go wrong. And now I think we're all spending a certain amount of our mental capacity just kind of on that stress. Mm -hmm. and it, it's, it's, you know, doubly compounds everything. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think I, you know, I personally just want to thank you and all of the, all of our fellow healthcare colleagues um, that are working sort of at the front lines and having to work extra, you know, shifts or longer hours or, um, um, you know, filling in for colleagues that may fall uh, sick. And uh, I think, I mean, it's just a thing, you know, a huge thank you. And, and I, you know, to everybody in the healthcare system, the pharmacists and the nurses and, um, you know, the people that help keep the hospitals clean and just like everybody that's working together. I think it's really fantastic.
Well, thanks. Um, and um, yeah, I think you are all, we all owe you a debt of gratitude. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. I appreciate it. I mean, I think that the, the big things is what we're finding with, um, you know, with good PPE, mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty easy to keep staff protected mm -hmm. um, with, you know, good practices, putting masks on all the patients, especially since we're seeing some patients that seem to be a little bit of a surprise to end up having uh, coronavirus. Uh, I think having... Um, you know, it's it's again. I'm I'm pretty young and pretty healthy. That I'm not worried about me getting sick. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I want to. Uh, you know, I my fear, my biggest fear right now is you know I'm either going to get somebody else sick mm -hmm. uh, who can't, or that you know I'm gonna I'm gonna get sick and then not be able to go to work and yeah. then be the burden on the healthcare system. Yeah. Oh, a lot to a lot to worry about. Yeah. But um, I think we've got good colleagues and. Yeah. Uh, you know, more and more information coming out every day to help uh, help us, I think. Yeah. But thanks. Um, you know, again, I'm an optimist. You know, this is why we do what we do. Yeah. This is why we get up in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, I mean, there's a great line from, uh, I think it's the first episode of Friends, uh, where Chandler is like, all right, everybody, I got to go to work. If I don't put those uh, put those numbers in the spreadsheet by this weekend, then, well, you know, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, you know, it's, it's uh, at the end of the day, you know, the whole reason we got into this, I get to put on pajamas and go to work. And take care of <laughs> yeah. So just wanted to add, uh, with everything going on, especially the social distancing, our office building is shutting down uh, so people can work from home. Uh, we are going to be trying some new different things with technology, probably doing some video conferencing in. Uh, things are going to look different, and we're going to figure out different ways to do it. Uh, but we are going to do the best we can to continue bringing you the best in medical publishing. So stay safe, social distance, wash your hands, and take care. Thanks.